Well, that was some introduction. Thank you so much, Sue, and thank you uh, for attending today. Thanks for being here on this occasion. Uh, it's really, really clear that to me that GSA has made a huge difference in, in both my professional and personal life, and we're talking about over the years, okay? Yeah, I don't know whether you recognize all the people in that picture, but there's George Davis with hair, circa, who knows? you know, maybe 1975. My, my mind carries meaningful specifics of GSA experiences that, that helped shape me. You know, as a college student, I attended my first GSA meeting, that was in New York City, and I gained a glimpse then of the scope of what it means to be a geologist. And at the, at the GSA annual meeting that coincided with the final year of my PhD program at Michigan, Jim Zumberg, who at the time was Dean of Earth Sciences at the University of Arizona, encouraged me to apply for this structural geology position that was just opening up at the University of Arizona. Did that change my life or what? And then one year after my very first talk at a GSA meeting, Clark Birchfield and Greg Davis motioned to me, called me over to have a beer, and, and wanted to chat about the paper that I had presented that day. I mean, that was heady stuff. That's all I talked about with my wife when I got back from that meeting. And then at a Penrose conference in Switzerland, I met John Ramsey, who was my hero in structural geology. I wish I would have brought today folding and fracturing of rocks by John Ramsey. It's just threadbare. It's just falling apart from, from wonderful use. And then on a field trip, a GSA field trip, I might add, uh, to the eastern Idaho, western Wyoming thrust belt, led by Dave Love, I met Peter Coney for the first time, who became my closest friend and colleague, the late Peter Coney, and it was there that our conversations really began in earnest about the Rincon Mountains and the Snake Range being part of a regionally coherent belt of metamorphic core complexes. And today, you know, within the annual rhythm of GSA meetings, I treasure connecting with, with reconnecting with old friends and making new friends and colleagues along the way. There's the, there's the new colleague shot right there, Anke Friedrich on the left, and new colleagues that I'm working with on Mount Lacayon uh, in the Peloponnesus. I want to say that I was drawn into geosciences uh, by three factors that Mary Ann Holmes and Suzanne O'Connell report as the main attractors for all who enter our discipline. Positive undergraduate experiences in geology, which I had at the College of Worcester. The love of outdoors, which I gained as a kid with very permissible, permissive parents in the best sense of that word, allowing me to wander around the hills and woods and creeks of western Pennsylvania and go caving. Okay, the, the family influence part. Love of outdoors, family influence, experiences in geology. And had I been a woman, or from an underrepresented minority, I likely never would have found geology. More to the point, and don't get this wrong, geosciences would never have found me. Mary Ann and Suzanne in 2005 presented a goal relation to attracting women and underrepresented minorities to the geosciences. And what they say is having sufficient role models such that each undergraduate who might aspire to a career in geosciences will have an inspiration, a person with whom they wish to emulate, a person whom they wish to emulate. So for the broadest of ranges of individuals and communities, I want GSA to be a source of collective inspiration, enabling individual geoscientists and communities of geoscientists to do their best work, thereby advancing science and its practice. And moreover, I want GSA to help leverage individual and collective accomplishments in ways that advance civilization and improve the human condition. Now, a good place to be in our individual professional lives is where our deepest passions and keenest skill sets intersect the world's most compelling needs. We recognize passion when we see it in ourselves and others, right? It's hard to miss, and it takes the form of unusually high enthusiasm towards what we do and how we do it. At our best, and when life circumstances permit, 
We have it in our elevated engagement in learning, in discovering, communicating, and in solving hairy problems, whether working in academia or in government or in the private sector. By and large, we seem to like what we do. You know, I think there is a lot of geoscience career envy out there. We see this in the name of cars people buy. I mean, <laughs> check out the list. Enclave, I did that for Scott Patterson. Enclaves in granite. Rendezvous, Grand Caravan, Echo Voyager, look at all of those. Consider how many models have names that conjure the images of geological exploration and discovery. And even journalists and politicians adopt our language. In September 2008, a New York Times reporter wrote that, quote, tectonic shifts, unquote, in the U.S. financial industry shook the world's markets. And a Wall Street Journal article stated that the economy was, like to suffer, was likely to suffer, quote, from the aftershocks of recent turmoil. And my favorite, the Associated Press exclaimed that none other than Alan Greenspan told Congress that the international credit crunch was a once-in-a-century credit tsunami. There you are. GSA supports the professional passion of individual geoscientists. GSA meetings, conferences, field trips bring us together, creating both formal and informal venues for connecting with one another. We discuss in person geo-relevant current events, such as trial verdicts, such as severe storms, such as coastal management. We describe to others what we are doing, and even more importantly, why. These conversations take place in the hallway. We prepare intensely to present our best thoughts at GSA meetings. And at annual meetings, the narratives of and the narratives by our medalists inspire us. Passion is one thing. Incorporating just the right skill sets is quite another. Especially in this age of new and emerging technologies, we recognize that skill sets are transient. They wear out. They need to be updated. New tools come along, you know, with increasing frequency. So if we can just go back to the Pleistocene for a moment, and if I can show you some of my College of Worcester pieces of homework and senior thesis, and some of you are out there of an age that you might even recognize these kinds of orthographic constructions. This was a rite of passage skill set that we all required to demonstrate using orthographic projection to determine net slip on a fault. Starting out with what? You could recite it. On one side of the fault, two intersecting dikes. On the other side of the fault, the same two intersecting dikes. Take their intersection, consider it a line, and find those piercing points on each side of the fault and work out, you know, the net slip and all the other slips that go along with it, right? A whole list. And the holy grail of all this is on the right. I mean, I enjoyed this form of sick fun so much in structural geology that I decided to spend a year of senior independent study on it. And the holy grail, as I began to say, is on the right, doing that drill for rotational faults. And then I went to the University of Texas, I'm unscripted here, and I was a TA in structure, and I subjected 20 students to a whole semester of orthographic projection labs with a couple of three-point problems shown, thrown in. Now, 50 years later, one of my undergraduate advisees, Philip McFarlane, geoscience plus applied math double major, mentored by graduate student, geophysicist Noam McDougall, engages in fault analysis that I couldn't have envisioned as an undergraduate. They were exploring a 3D seismic volume of faulted strata, digitizing discrete stratigraphic horizons, mapping the tip lines, checking out individual normal faults, evaluating gradient of slip. And then what they do for fun, you know, they work their way in these volumes and they move up and down through the seismic volume. What you would have seen is the migration of those fault traces at different depth levels. You'd see faults tipping out. We can all imagine it, right? <clears throat> so let me also say that outside of school settings, GSA helps with the skill sets part of our individual lives. For example, GSA short courses have been a vital means 
for staying abreast of new methods, approaches, technologies, and since 1982, there have been more than 300 short courses have been taught here. At this Charlotte meeting, there's a new GSA record, 29 short courses in record, record participation. You know, a central, second central mission of GSA that's embraced by GSA is doing all we can to support cohorts of geoscientists in common subdisciplines or specialty fields. We all understand the practical power of special, specialization, which is so clearly expressed in what we choose to work on and how we choose to work. The list here of GSA's 17 divisions reflects one way in which we arrange ourselves in subdisciplinary clusters. The programs of GSA annual meetings and regional section meetings are framed dominantly through the lenses of divisions and, sec and subdisciplines and specialty fields. Every year at meetings, I'm overawed by the tenaciousness of the specialty fields collectively taking on seemingly intractable, intractable problems and bringing those problems to their knees. Of course, there's another side of this coin. It's not just the skill sets that wear out. John Suppy once reminded us that even specialty fields wear down, typically lasting less than a scientific career. A given subdiscipline, in his language, may become a ghost town, good western Arizona jargon, or may just seem to disappear as the number of new specialties appear. Knowledge fragmentation is what results, driven partly by, quote, geoscientists unable to stay abreast of all the research within their own discipline. Breath Fratissi and Lynn Vacher in, in 2008 captured this in this compelling graphic. They grouped journals in subdiscipline categories and mapped journal proliferation from 1945 to 2000. And check out the flow boundaries in the stream. And the emergence of new lines of research tends to be accompanied by the emergence of more and more specialized journals. And no wonder that at times we feel like we're swimming upstream. GSA concluded a long time ago that the disciplinary cohorts are essential but are not sufficient. They're not sufficient to sustain healthy geosciences. We began to organize ourselves into regional sections way back in 1901. Among other things, the section meetings are important venues for students, you know, presenting their research results. Furthermore, our primary publications always have been cross-disciplinary. Of course, GSA's Penrose conferences are designed to pull geoscientists together from different disciplines and from different career paths, academia, government, pri private practice. There, there have been 150 Penrose conferences held since 1969. This is just a, f just a few of them right here. This isn't by any means a comprehensive list, but we need to keep them coming and we need to attract a broader range of disciplines to take full advantage of this forum for scientific exchange. Now, just like the basic and applied sciences, the world's compelling needs that must be addressed through geosciences are ones that require both specialty and unifying cross-disciplinary action. Now, if we wish to be reminded of the most pressing world needs, we can focus attention, for example, on the most stressed conditions of the globe, as was done last August in the second theme session of the 34th International Geological Congress held in Brisbane, Australia. The theme session was entitled Geoscience Benefiting Low-Income Countries. There's a title. And as we read the theme statements, I hope you can read them from your seats, Medical Geology for Human Survival and Welfare, role of geosciences in protecting e ecosystems. You read that list and I think you'll agree that these priorities apply universally. Similarly, AGI has identified 21st century challenges, underscoring the interplay of natural resources, environmental quality, resiliency. And NSF's GeoVision report 2009 has a comparable emphasis addressing the interfaces between atmospheric, ocean, and the earth sciences. And we see strategic planning language in brochures. I think the world's needs can be framed productively as well in everyday terms, underscoring the threats our world faces. Ignorance, thirst, hunger, environmental degradations, 
shortages, excesses, hazards. These are the clarion calls for the best we have to offer, and at this moment in time. Back in 1990, an author who's become a friend, Robert Gruden, did not mince words. Quote, a world population growing by a billion every decade and increasingly demanding of technological conveniences will make short work of existing energy sources and tear the environment to shreds, 1990. Similarly, this year's GSA's, GSA President's Medalist, Bill McKibben, tells it like it is. In his book entitled Earth with Two A's, McKibben writes, quote, We've turned our cars and factories into junior volcanoes, and so we're not just producing carbon faster than the plant world can absorb it, we're also making it so hot that the plants absorb less carbon than they used to. And he goes on to say, suddenly you felt a little less confident that you were an explorer, navigator, forester, mountaineer, scout, tracker, trooper, wrangler, pathfinder, trailblazer. You all of a sudden were in Kansas. I'm still quoting Bill McKibben, not Durango or Tahoe or Denali or the Yukon. Discovery and escape and excursion suddenly seemed less important than the buzz-killing fact that it took a hundred bucks to fill the tank. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Fundamental research in our specialty fields is key to addressing world's compelling needs, but not sufficient. But let's take some of the strength of specialty fields. I asked colleague Jim Dolan, James Dolan, University of Southern California, fantastic scientist in active tectonics, to illustrate the power of connecting specialty fields in ways that inform for us today probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And, the, and with the goal, of course, of mitigating loss of life and property due to earthquakes. Dolan is among those wrestling with the inconsistency that inferred slip rates based on geodesy sometimes, if not often, outpace those inferred on the basis of geology. James and one of his students, Ben Harovich, have been evaluating slip rates on big faults on the basis of geological mapping and LIDAR-based restoration of faulted geomorphic surfaces. They determine ages of faulted geomorphic surfaces through cosmogenic surface exposure dating, connecting specialty fields, as in the example shown here, developed by the late Kurt Frankel, another of James' students. Dolan and Harovich concluded that the degree to which geologically-based fault slip rates record the actual rate at seismogenic depths is strongly dependent on the structural maturity of the fault zone. Before a fault zone becomes, let's say, straight and through going, quote unquote, a considerable amount of the slip budget is diffused through distributed deformation away from the fault itself. But to model seism seismogenic hazards, it's absolutely essential to know the true, not the apparent, seismogenic slip rate. Now, in spite of such sophisticated core science, we still struggle mightily at addressing particular structure, strategic outliers that, if not tightly connected to the core, will threaten the capacity of the geosciences to make a difference in the manner to which we aspire. Among these strategic outliers are geosciences and public policy, geosciences and K through 12, geoscience and the media, and geoscience and its future workforce. There's a sharp contrast, I believe, in the ways in which we are excelling as individual geoscientists and cohorts of scientists in fundamental and applied research versus our impact with respect to these strategic outliers. Why is this? Part relates to the internal dynamics and barriers within our own scientific culture our personal specialty goals and responsibilities, I can testify, they tend to be all-consuming, orthographic projection. Furthermore, the work environments within which you operate tend to reward us most when we stick to our specialty areas. Thus, it's natural for each of us 
to defer to our specialist in earth science education, public policy, geoscience workforce, and in reaching the media and the general public. But given what's at stake in terms of the world's pressing needs, I believe that GSA is right to be distinguished by a broad and encompassing mission scope that, goes, that includes, of course, but goes beyond our fundamental core specialties. Strong platforms have already been built. You know, one of the, one of the specialty, one of the core platforms dates back in GSA to 1972 when the, when the Geology and Public Policy Committee was established. And over the years, this GPP committee has been producing position statements. Now there are some 30 occupying four different categories, geosciences issues, education issues, data issues, and professional issues. Not written in geospeak, but there to help decision makers and policy makers get their arms and hands you know, around the issues. The framing of position statements is sometimes straightforward. Others have a complexity that I can underscore by saying to you just one word, hydrofracking. Hydrofracking, now I've said it twice. Here it is, this is a wonderful cartoon I stumbled upon and gained permission to use from Kip Jarden. Look at that stratigraphy, can you read that stratigraphy? There's, you know, and basically with GSA Council approval, GPPC has initiated the development of a white paper on hydrofracking with the goal of sorting facts from fiction in an arena of conflicting interests. Now part of my work as a GPPC member was attending the special session at the North Central Association meeting in Dayton last spring on shale gas and fracking. And Jeffrey Daniels of Ohio State University presented. And I heard Jay, J Jeff say something powerful that applies at every turn within the outlier of geosciences and public policy. And I'm paraphrasing, Jeff says, geoscientists represent the only profession anywhere that knows how to picture the subsurface. Voters, communities, public officials simply have no idea how to visualize what's down below, let alone discriminate what is factual from what is not, let alone evaluate proposed solutions. I want to expand using my own language. I would submit that geosciences is the only scientific community, this is a long sentence coming up, that can actually picture what happens right at, beneath, and deep beneath the Earth's surface today, at any spot on the globe, and can picture past subsurfaces in relation to past oceans and past atmospheres over the spans of vast time and ever-changing circumstances, and can picture all of this dynamically, not simply statically. I'm not saying we know it all, but this is what we do. In the pictures we create of the Earth's surface and subsurface, past, present, and future, are not constructed through single disciplines or specialty fields. Emphasizing this moves us away from the forces of fragmentation, geology versus geophysics, hard rock versus soft rock, pure versus applied, I hate that, academic versus professional practice, this specialty or that. Now I tend to look at challenges as glasses half full. Robert Gruden, who I referred to before, he can see things in a really stark reality. This is from his book, Grace of Great Things. I tend, I tend seldom to read to people, but I'm going to read. Politicians assemble in committees and call in experts to testify. Natural scientists appear in force. Business scientists, military scientists, government scientists, scientists from the ac academy. The specialists not only hold conflicting views, but speak in different forms of jargon. The individual politician must then make a decision. The politician's staff is consulted. One staffer has been sifting the media for editorial consensus. Another has been lunching with the lobbyists. A third who has hired consultants summarize their report. A fourth phones in a long distance with word from the constituency. A position is hammered out in conference. 
A fifth staffer writes an appropriate speech, and here's Gruden's plain language, and the interdisciplinary function of politics has been fulfilled again. 1990, he laid this thing out. And my response is, I believe that it is essential to address the interdisciplinary function of politics with the interdisciplinary function of geosciences. I want to urge our thinking creatively about potential new interdisciplinary initiatives that can accelerate GSA's addressing all of the strategic outliers simultaneously and in ways that resist fragmentation and reward alignment. My thinking on this began more than a year ago when Jeff Feist, who you heard from a moment ago, you know, president of the Geological Society of America Foundation, asked a number of us, if Dr. Penrose walked into this hall right now and said, I'm willing to invest considerably into a large idea, what would that idea be, you know, for GSA? Now that's an idea, that's a question that's really worth thinking about. So as I've thought about it, my quote answer takes the form of a proposal, a proposed response conference, a proposed proposal for response conferences to geo events impacting population centers. And I'd like to describe what I mean by this for a moment by virtually turning around once and suddenly presenting to you my mock report on a virtual response conference that we'll say was held a few months ago. May I do that? I'm going to give a report on the first response conference. Good afternoon. GSA's most recent response conference was triggered by a 5.8 earthquake that took place at 1.51 p.m. local time in Northern Virginia, August 23rd, 2011. The epicenter was located 130 kilometers south-southwest of the nation's capital. The White House and Capitol were evacuated. Metro system trains ran at reduced speeds while tunnels were inspected. Staff at the National Zoo reported that the apes were feeding normally up till 10 seconds before the quake, but then they abandoned their food and scrambled to the top of their habitat. The ground shaking lasted 45 seconds. Receiving most of the media attention was the shaking and the damage to the Washington Monument. We, we know that. The monument suddenly began to sway, and those visitors inside, many of whom were school children, needed to make a quick escape down the stairs. And what you should be seeing was captured on a surveillance camera inside the monument, 150 meters above the ground level. The Washington Monument experienced permanent damage expressed by fracturing, spalling, especially in the height interval between 140 meters and 160 meters. Now, Vice President Joe Biden was at the campaign stop in Virginia touring the administration's energy policy, touting it. He blamed the earthquake on extraction of natural gas by hydrofracking, just to make certain some of these pieces of the talk come together. And as reported in the Washington Times, things got political in a hurry, and I'm picturing here Benjamin Cole to the right of Vice President Biden, he's the communications director at the Institute for Energy Research, he was quoted as saying, the worst kept secret in Washington is Vice President Biden's penchant for exaggeration. Now he's pretending to be a seismologist. I couldn't resist saying that. Six months following this earthquake, on Saturday, February 4, 2012, the Geological Society of America, in partnership with its associated societies and the United States Geological Survey, held a Central Virginia Earthquake Response Conference in Washington, D.C. The purpose was to host a public retrospective on science and society dimensions of the earthquake event. GSA was able to work swiftly because five years ago, committees had been established to forecast possible geo-incident events in North America and to populate tactical working teams of experts. The critical planning window after the Virginia earthquake was on the order of eight weeks. And during that time, GSA re reserved a venue in the DC area. They established a Saturday calendar date. They notified the executive branch, the Hill, the Pentagon, the emergency responder agencies, 
GSA alerted teachers and professors in the region. They urged them to consider incorporating the conference into the curriculum. GSA communicated the planned event to the media and the general public and invited the membership of GSA to turn out in force. GSA was able to accomplish this in part through cooperation between its Boulder, Colorado headquarters and its northeastern and southeastern sections. The contents of the program follow the standard blueprint for response conferences with two main rules for engagement, no geospeak and admissions for students, teachers, media and elected officials is free of charge. The morning session is, plen is plenary and it addresses questions such as what exactly happened? Has this kind of thing happened before? How did institutes and agencies and individual citizens respond? What can we learn from the geological record that will help us think about where such things might happen in the future? Are our emergency management plans up to speed with respect to the crisis that took, a place, took place? And then the afternoon session was marked by engagement in workshops which focused in part on K through 12, in part on education and broad policy, and in that case, policymakers around the table with scientists working away. Also in this mock report, I'm saying that at the upcoming GSA annual meeting in Charlotte, the plenary speakers and workshop facilitators in the Northern Virginia Response Conference will hold debriefings on what they presented and will report on the responses from students, teachers, media, public officials, the scientific community. A number of GSA members noted that we commonly lament how difficult it is to connect with members of the media and yet because of the response conference, the media came to us. Back to real life, I thank Jeff for demonstrating that when the right question is asked, we get some answers that elevate our science, our thinking, our imagination generally. Let us, each of us, think hard about how we would respond to Dr. Penrose in ter and try to emulate, in terms of imagination and forward-looking, the kinds of things that he envisioned might be possible through a Geological Society of America. In conclusion, and to repeat, what guides my value system as your GSA president is to have GSA continue to function in ways that help individual geoscientists and communities of geoscientists do their best work, advancing the science and its practice, leveraging individual and collective accomplishments to advance civilization and to improve the human condition. Thank you very much for your attention.